need it now. So, and I believe today, Anthony's going to bring a message for the now. That's going to bring a message that's going to be an encounter that you need today. So without further ado, can we all please stand and give Anthony an amazing round of applause. All right. What's with the, the phone dropping anointing this morning? Oh my gosh. Wow, you guys are all so beautiful. Look at your neighbor and say, you are so beautiful. And if you never told your neighbor that they're so beautiful and you had a crush on them, just give them a little wink after you say that. I'm just, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Um, man, it's so good to be here. It is so good uh, to have Bethesda as a home church. And... Um, I want to say really fast, can I brag on you guys for a second? Cool, so who, here, who was here for the conference um, that we just had? Wasn't it amazing? Just incredible. So uh, before um, uh, Libby Gordon left, um, Brigida and I talked to her, with her while she was in kids, and we were just kind of debriefing about how the whole conference went. And um, she was like, you, uh, I told her, I said, Libby, it felt like I was back at first year at Bethel a School of Supernatural Ministry. She goes, Anthony, I felt the same way. She's like, but I'll be honest. She goes, you guys are hungrier than our first year school of Bethel students. I'm like, I was like, you're just being nice. She's like, no, I'm serious. She's like, you guys should come down to Bethel to, to make our students more hungry. She's like, we have never been in a place, we've never been to church that's, that's, been, that's been hungry as you guys. It's crazy. So can we just give it up for Bethesda Church for being so hungry for Jesus? Is that amazing? Come on. I, that, that's like, that's a testimony that us as a church, we want to hear that, amen? Man, that's just so cool. Look at your neighbor and say, thank you. Look at your other na neighbor and say, thank you. All right. Very cool. Well, um, I love being a little interactive when I preach, and so if you hear something good, you just say amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, testify. If something's so good, you just gotta get up off your seat and run around the church, you can. If you feel the Holy Ghost and you gotta roll, go for it. We, um, uh, <laughs> we, we uh, in this youth, this, we have this youth revival in my hometown, and, and the Holy Spirit worked like clockwork where it was like the worship would be so anointed and in the middle of worship we'd do an altar call, altar call for people to get saved because unbelievers would weep in the worship. And then after worship, would, after, after that we'd worship for like 30 more minutes and after 30 minutes, literally on the dot, holy laughter would break out and people would start rolling on the, literally they'd roll on the floor. Like these are students that have never seen the old revival tapes. They just feel like they have to roll on the floor and run around the building. And then, um, and then, uh, people would be so the people who got saved were so shocked. They were like, what's happening? We're like, they're getting filled with the Holy Ghost. You want to get filled with the Holy Ghost? They said, sure. And so in that middle of that set, they would get baptized in the Holy Spirit and get drunk in the Holy Spirit and fall down. And we even got to the message yet. And then we get to the message and then, you know, they get equipped and then we'd feed them food afterwards. It was crazy. It was just like, who's going to weep? Like, oh, we got a new guy or we got like five new guys. Watch them all cry during worship. And sure enough, during worship, they're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. It was so cool. So anyways, if you just feel that, uh, you're more than welcome to, to go that direction. Sound good? All right, we're gonna pray really fast. See, my son's already rolling on the floor. Good job, buddy. Um, so uh, let's just pray. Holy Ghost, we love you. We thank you for this morning. God, we pray that as this message speaks, we pray that there would be a giant slain this morning. And God, we just pray that it wouldn't just be for our community, but it would be for our region, it would be for our city, it would be for our state, it would be for our nation. And God, we pray that, that this giant that would fall would, uh, as it falls, revival would come. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. So I'm really excited to, to speak today because um, before in the infancy of uh, talking about family groups, I, I was sharing with uh, Donnie, who's one of the uh, guys spearheading it with Rick and Michelle and the whole team. Um, I was like, man, I really wanna preach a message on the power of community uh, before you guys launch. And they're like, oh, that'd be amazing. And then all of a sudden, uh, Tisha, I, got, I saw I was scheduled to preach, and I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Before uh, the family groups launch, I get to speak a message on the power of community. So I'm really excited to share it with you this morning, just because community is, uh, is one of the most powerful forces that we have 
uh, really in, in, in all of humanity. When people are banded together, they can achieve the impossible. And so, um, and, and <laughs> come on, son, he's, he's got the running too. Let's go. Don't mind him. He's filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, uh, so yeah, so we're just going to dive right into this, if that's okay. So in the past 20 years, there has been a massive uptick in depression and anxiety and addiction. And um, it's staggering uh, for the mental health, um, uh, uh, for, you know, um, for, for psychologists and, and people that study mental health because they're, they're seeing this trend that's almost to the point where it's unstoppable. Where they're like, how, how are we going to change this uptick that we've seen? And this is just even before COVID. So the statistics that of, of, of the, like the increase and all this was before COVID. After COVID, it's significantly worse. And all the statistics I'm bringing up today, um, after COVID, they're significantly worse than how they are right now. I don't know how they are and that I'm gonna be mentioning today. And also, what is also in a trend is suicide is the number one killer of young people today. That more young people die by suicide than any other disease um, uh, currently around right now. <laughs> I love, my, I love my, dun, my son. He's so free. Yeah, you can. That's fine. Or, because <laughs> I just want to watch him play. He has all my attention. Oh. It's okay, you do, whatever, you, you do whatever you think is best. And so with these statistics, um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the mental health um, organizations, their, um, their solution for this has mostly been medication. They're like, we're, we're, gonna, uh, we're, gonna give you, we're gonna give you drugs, there's something wrong with your brain, and that's pretty much the solution that's been there for a very long time. And I'm not here to uh, talk anything medical, I'm just here to give you information, is that okay? And so um, what they've discovered, or what they're beginning to discover, is that there is a, there's about nine different con, uh, reasons why uh, people are experiencing anxiety and depression and addiction, but the biggest of all of them, some of them are like loss of connection, uh, some of them are um, uh, mo no motivation, no drive, no feeling of no purpose in life, but the largest one in our society right now, out of all of these, is loneliness that the driving force behind the uptick of the 20 year trend of anxiety, depression, and addiction is loneliness. And so what this has done is it's required people to look a different way than what they thought was normal because as they're getting to know individuals that struggle with anxiety and depression, they're finding that it may not just be a chemical imbalance in the brain, it might actually be something wrong with our society. Can I give you more statistics? I'm just dropping water today too. Okay, right now, as it stands in society today, we're the lonely, loneliness, the loneliest, sorry, society in human history. A recent study asked Americans, do you feel, uh, do you feel uh, no longer close to anyone? And 40% of Americans polled, they feel like they have, they, they don't feel close to anyone anymore. 40%, that means if we have 300 people in this room, the, uh, Almost the majority, almost half of you would say you don't, ha you don't feel like you have any connection with anyone whatsoever. When polled again, um, asking if they had a crisis, if there was anyone they could call, a decade ago, the average person in America polled that they had five, pers five people that they could reach out to in a time of crisis. They just released that poll recently, a couple years ago, pre-COVID, and it came back that the majority of Americans polled that they have no one they could contact in a time of crisis. They've discovered that being lonely is as bad for your health as, smoky, as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And they said the feeling of loneliness releases the same amount of the stress hormone cortisol as getting punched in the face. This is crazy, isn't it? So the giant, I think, that is in, is in our midst right now as a nation is the giant of loneliness. And I feel that as Bethesda, we need to raise up Davids who will kill that giant. Yeah. 
So if we look back at human history, you could, you could gather that in the early days of humanity, um, before technology, Amer like just people in general could not do much alone. Like if you had one lone warrior out there and a, tri and a, and a um, lion was attacking a tribe, do you think that one guy with a wooden spear could kill a lion? No. So human history is always, um, has always gathered around some sort of tribe. They've gathered around some sort of community. Why? Because working together creates better results than working alone. So throughout all of humanity, uh, humanity has gathered to work together to accomplish goals. Everything from protection, everything from you know, slaying animals to hunting, uh, similar like uh, bees, like bees, they, um, they grew up to, uh, to be in a hive. And so what we've done now is we're the first time in society where we are no longer working in a tribal formation. So as bees were created to work in a hive, mankind was created to work in a tribe. And what we've done is, we do it often, we even do it in church, is we say, well, I'll say it in society. So in society, we say that um, money doesn't bring you happiness, right? Well, they did a poll recently um, in America, and the poll was, what is one thing you do when you're sad that makes you happy? And the majority answer came back for Americans was to buy something. They did the same poll in Europe, and the Europeans came back with, when they feel bad, they, uh, what they do to feel bad is they reach out to help somebody else. So junk food, we all understand, right? Junk food is bad for our bodies, right? If I ate McDonald's every day, <laughs> do you think I'd have a healthy plan? Do you think that would be nutritional for my life? So that's the same thing that junk values do to us. And when I say junk values, I mean this. So we all, as Americans, if you ever watch family movies, you see on the movies, they go like, you know, the, the rich, the, the, the pro-business father realizes that family was the most important all along, right? And that, that money doesn't matter, that family's the most important, and, and all that jazz. Well, with this recent poll, of buying something, it has shown that America, even though everyone believes that, that money isn't the root of happiness, our society is going in the opposite direction. Even though it's all a core value that we believe that, oh yeah, you know, money uh, doesn't bring me happy, our society is telling us the opposite. And how is it telling us the opposite? Instagram, through comparison, you go on Instagram, you see all these people who have better lives than you. And okay, those who are older, you don't even know what Instagram is, just bear with me. All the young people, you understand what it is. It's okay. I understand there's a cultural, a cultural difference. But on Instagram, you go on Instagram or any social media, everyone is propping up their life to look like the best life ever. And how do they do it? They don't do it by hanging out with friends. They do it by the cars they drive, the places they travel, and the houses they live in. So subconsciously, we are feeding ourselves with junk values that's producing a unhealthy society. <laughs> Selah. So what we've learned is that America is lonely. And how America is meeting its loneliness is through junk values of materialism. So now with that, what is the church's response? And what we've learned so far is that the source, the root of people's anxiety and depression and addiction statistically speaking, is loneliness. So what's the biblical response? Go to Psalm 68, four through six. We're gonna have it on the screen. You don't have to turn your Bible. Do we have that up, Israel? Can we get it up for the, the media team? They're amazing. Maybe we don't have it up. Um, okay, if you have your Bible, go, ahead, go to uh, Psalm 68, four through six, and when you get there, say amen. Do we got it, Israel? All right, go ahead and put it up, if you can. 
All right, read with me together. Sing praises to God and to his name. Sing loud praises to him who rides on the clouds, whose name is the Lord's. Rejoice in his presence. Father to the fatherless, defender of the uh, widows, this is God whose dwelling is holy. I love how God is, he's choosing to be identified as this. He's like, my presence is everywhere. By the way, I'm a father of the fatherless and defender of the widows. This is me and my holiest habitation. (laughs) God places the lonely in families and he sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. So what is the biblical response to loneliness in America? It's beginning to take people into a family. It's beginning to father to fatherless, defend the widows, acknowledge his presence, and bring people into families. Which is why we decided to name it family group, not prison cell groups. I've always hated cell groups. I don't know what the definition of cell group was, but to me, I always thought of prison cell. And I'm like, well, I don't want to be trapped in a group with you. We're calling it family groups. Why? Because he puts the lonely in families. And what people are discovering right now is that family is what's beginning to heal people that have anxiety, addiction, and depression. There's a a doctor by the name of Sam Everington in New York that treats uh, hundreds of people with anxiety and depression, and he treated them medically with, um, you can look this up, he treated them medically with, uh, with, you know, with drugs. And I have no issue with drugs. There are people that, you know, they they do need medication, and that's fine, but there also is a, a majority, there's a big people that don't need that, they just need connection. And a woman came to him by the name of Lisa Cunningham, you can look this up, Lisa Cunningham, and he said, hey, and he's, she's been seeing him for years, and he said, hey, I wanna try something new with you. Um, let's, give you the, let's give you the drugs, but I wanna get you uh, part of this group. And uh, this group is, is people that help and treat anxiety and depression. And so she was so anxious that she had to lock herself in her home every day and she would throw up at the sight, at, uh, at the thought of even meeting, it, even meeting anyone. And so, she, like almost seven days a week, she was trapped in her home, in her apartment, in the UK, because she had such crippling, lo- uh, such crippling anxiety and depression. And so she uh, decided to go to this group, and just even the, the first day of the group, everyone's in this group is together, and they're, they're all super anxious. They all threw up before they even gathered. You know, they're all this super anxious group. And of course, in this group, they're they're talking about their issues. They're talking about the struggles of anxiety and depression. But then they begin to do something different. Um, they 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 didn't dwell on their anxiety and depression. They decided to begin to conquer things together as a group. And so collectively in this group, they decided to pick up gardening. Now, none of them have ever uh, done gardening before. They've never pursued gardening, but they decided, let's uh, pick up gardening. So they ran to the library together and they started reading books on gardening and they had uh, this garden that they built together in this place. And all of a sudden, what they began to realize is as they started working in the soil and, um, uh, and learning how to garden, they began, conversations open up for deep connection and deep bonding. And what they began to realize is as they bonded and as they had connection, the anxiety got less and less and less and the depression got less and less and less. And Lisa Cunningham says, uh, said this quote, when she talks about it, it says, as the, as the garden began to bloom, we began to bloom also. And then as this community got together, Uh, they began to problem solve and fix other people's problems. One of the persons in the group was uh, was sleeping on a bus every single day because he had no home. And they were like, of course you're anxious and have anxiety or sleeping on a a bus. Who wouldn't feel depressed if they're sleeping on a bus? And so they actually banded together and wrote a law in the UK and got the law passed that created housing for people that were homeless like him. And what they began to discover was meeting people's loneliness was beginning, and through the connection of family and bonding, that's what began to heal people of depression and anxiety and addiction. (laughs) It's funny because we do this often, I see it often, and I'm not saying this is us, okay, but when we're, we're charismatic, we're Holy Ghost, And we really love to criticize other churches that don't flow with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Yeah, honesty, let's go. 
I love you guys. That's me. I totally did that. And we're like, oh, the Holy Spirit builds a church. You don't have the Holy Spirit. Oh, my gosh. Blah, 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 blah. We come against them. Like, you're not doing Lord, Lord's will. Who's ever said anything like that? Yeah, okay. Like, less hands went up. Thank you. <laughs> you're like, I'm not admitting that one, you know. And, um, but what, but what, what I've noticed is we all are camping around the fire of the Holy Spirit, which is beautiful, and we all should camp around that fire. But the evangelical church, the one that doesn't have the Holy Spirit, uh, like, or pursuing them like we do, they don't necessarily camp around that fire, but they camp around a different fire. And they camp around the fire of community. And they may not be able to have the shaka rasada or the words of knowledge from the stage or the anointed long hour worship that we do, but they do something that makes them grow, which, me, which is they create family in their community. And so what I think is there needs to be a marriage of the two yes. where we are pursuing the Lord with fire and we have moments where we're weeping and crying and we're getting wrecked by the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, we have a vibrant community that's filled with believers that know each other, that, that understand each other, that listen to one another, that walk with each other. Come on. I'm trying to figure out where I'm at with my notes. <laughs> um, there was this woman, uh, I used to be part of this very large church um, in California, and there was this a woman uh, at our church named Marsha. And Marsha and I'm not saying we have any Marshas here, but you've all had Marshas in your life. And Marsha was one of those people who just like went through tons of counseling, had a bajillion sozos, but she was not transformed. Like uh, depressed, just carried rejection. You ever pe felt people that there's, they carry so much rejection that your natural response is to reject them? You know, you're just like, I don't know why, like, you know, how are you today? You didn't ask what's up. You know, they're like, they're just carry rejection, right? Like, you can never say or do anything. Everything you say is just rejection, rejection, rejection. And, you know, and when she walked into the church, it was like a cloud hung over her head, you know, just, and there was nothing you could do to reach Marsha. Marsha would just, any good word that you would throw at her, she would just shut it down with her rejection. And so we're, we're getting up because we launched a school ministry in this church, and we're getting ready for our school ministry. And then we see online an application for Marsha for our school ministry. We all had a good heart check at that one. And we were like, I was like, Marsha, Marsha at school? I'm like, oh Lord, like, I, I'm hoping she doesn't bring us down. She's that negative, you know? How dare you, Anthony? You've all thought the same thing. Don't look at me. You all thought about it. You're all not, you're all not innocent about that. You all have Marsha's. So anyways, so, Come time for the interviews, and we're interviewing students, and one of our team interviews Marsha, and they come back, and they go, guys, I felt the wind of God on Marsha coming to school. And all of us are like, oh, no, like, <laughs> just being transparent. We're like, man, she's going to require a lot of work, failed counseling, failed sozo, failed coming up praying for all the, her issues. But we weren't prepared for what God was going to do with Marsha. <laughs> See, she had the sozos. And she had the prayer, and she had the counseling. But the one thing she lacked in life was family. And in one month of seeing Marsha be a part of a revival group of 20 students pursuing the Lord with her, at one month of being in a small group of people, four together, praying for each other every time they met, getting to know each other, we began to see the concrete heart of Marsha begin to crack. Nine months later, Marsha was no longer Marsha of rejection, she was Marsha of hope. She was no longer cowardly, uh, a sad Marsha that didn't want to do anything. She was fiery, she was passionate, she was alive in her calling Marsha. She even applied for the second year program and got accepted for our second year program. She applied for the internship program, got accepted for the internship program, and after her internship program, she became staff, part of the school. See, some of your impossible scenarios, you've done it all. You've done the sozos, you've done the counseling, you've done the prayer, you've had the anointed people lay hands on you. 
But the breakthrough that you're looking for is found in family. The healing that you're looking for is found in family. Uh, can we do the um, Acts 2.46? Uh, yeah, very cool. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Verse seven. All the while praising God, enjoying the goodwill of all the people, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Let, now let's think about what we just read for a second. We just read that the people in the early church are meeting, they're worshiping in the temple, then after that, they're breaking bed and they're eating together, and then what is the cause of doing all of that? And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. Say it again for those in the back. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. You want to know how churches that don't have the Holy Spirit grow? They grow because, and each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. They grow because they have community. They grow because they have family. They grow because when you get there, you're suddenly eating a meal with someone's house. I don't know what, I, this is not a shade at us. I don't know what it is about Holy Ghost churches, but for some reason, Holy Ghost churches are the least family-connected churches. I used to be a part of a massive church. I'm not gonna uh, share the name. And every Friday, I was leading people to Jesus when we went evangelizing. I would bring people to church on Sunday of this massive church, a well-renowned church, world church, and I would say, do you have any type of small group or any sort of new believers class I could bring these people? Because I was bringing, I was picking them up in my car on Sunday, bringing them to church, and I had them with me. Do you have any new believers class for these people? And their answer was no. Do you have any small group I can connect these people with? And their answer was no. But what should our answer be? Yes. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. Yes. Peter saved 3,000 people in a day because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they maintained the revival out of community. They maintained the revival that God was doing in the early church out of community, out of family, out of fellowship, out of meeting each other, out of eating with each other, out of breaking bread. They maintained it. See, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will get people in the door, but family will keep them here. Why? Because no one wants to leave their family. No one wants to leave their family. And I'll tell you what, all the people who transition to Holy Spirit Church, you know what the hardest thing for them to do is? They always say, the most difficult thing for me to do is to leave my community, is to leave my family. Why? Because that was the most powerful part of their previous community. I believe we can be a shift in that statistic. I believe we can be a shift when it comes to that identity. I believe that that Bethesda, come on, can be a Holy Ghost church and a Holy Family church at the same time. Amen? Come on. The shoes are coming off. If you're an immersed student, you know what that is. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We're gonna do one more verse, can we? James uh, 4.16. Who guys remember, who, who uh, anyone remember Frodo Fest we did back in the day? <laughs> oh, 516, thank you. I, I said four, but I got that wrong. It was 516. You guys remember me and, uh, me and uh, Rachel in Hobbit outfits with Kyle? Who remembers that? A long time ago. Who has no idea what I'm talking about? Wow, oh my gosh. When I first got hired here, I did video, video announcements for the church, and they were so funny. I remember one Sunday, we didn't have video announcements, and the whole church went, Oh, anyways, if you're crafty, if you go on the Bethesda community page and go to the video section, you could watch all of our really ridiculous video announcements. We were, we were, we were like TikTok before it got famous. Um, okay, so hold on, 516, sorry. 
I wanted to, I want to go to this really fast because I, I love this passage. So here's James, and he's talking about the power of prayer. He's talking about a power of community. He basically says, are any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church and come pray over you, anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. Um, if any of you have committed sins, you will be forgiven. So, so, so James is talking about here in a church community. He's saying, if there's anyone in your church community that, that's sick, call for the elders of the church. Call for the leadership of the church. Tell them that you're sick, and when they pray for you, you'll get healed. So already, that James is laying down that the power of community, um, the power of being uh, in a church, will, has an anointing for healing that you can't get anywhere else. He didn't say, go find Paul, who's the only person who could pray for healing, and get him to lay his hands on you so that you could get healed. No, James said, hey, go to your church, find the leaders of the church, tell them that you're struggling with sickness, and the grace that's over a body will come and heal you. The anointing over a fellowship that meets in the presence of God will heal you. And not only that, your sins will also, you'll receive forgiveness. You'll experience the forgiveness of your sins when you meet in this type of community, okay? So that's what Paul's saying. You know, we, we glance the scripture, we read it really fast, but Paul's saying there is breakthrough, so much breakthrough in just meeting in a fellowship. There's so much breakthrough in just going to people and being vulnerable about you need healing that you receive breakthrough in a fellowship, okay? Now then he says this in verse 16. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other um, and pray for others so that you may be healed. An earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Say wonderful results. So now he's saying this in the context of meeting in family. He's saying, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed because prayers of righteous people produce wonderful results. Some of you here, you don't have wonderful results and you need wonderful results. And the only way you're gonna get wonderful results is to begin to confess to your community what's going on in your life. Why? Because the junk value tells us to be isolated, to be alone. It's all about me, 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 me. And even churches today, it's all about the pastor and the sound and how, what they're wearing and preachers and sneakers. And, and what's problem is, is we're not getting wonderful results. Because wonderful results are found in this. They're found in family. They're found in community. It doesn't say, get, get a famous preacher to pray for you and then his prayer will bring wonderful results. No, it says, confess to one another so that their prayer will bring wonderful results. Now, when they say confess your sins, we get a little tied up with the word sin. We're like, oh, sin, oh, you know. And there might be people who'd be like, I don't struggle with any sin. And you might not. You might not have any uh, type of habitual, you know, um, uh, failures or whatever. But the Bible is so funny when it talks about sin. It, when it talks about sin, it, it's ta it not, most times it doesn't just mention a verb. It actually mentions a noun. It talks about the entity of sin or the, the fullness of sin. And so when, do you guys know that unbelief is sin? Do you know that fear is sin? Do you know that doubt is sin? Now, we're like, oh, should I feel so sinful and shameful and grieved that, that I had a doubtful thought? No, because the power of sin which is the entity of all that, no longer has power over you. Which is why you should confess your sins to one another. It's because sin doesn't have power over you anymore. So when we think confess sins, we think of, oh, I have to confess my wrongdoings. No, when was the last time you went to someone and said, I am struggling with so much anxiety. I am struggling with so much depression. My marriage is failing. You, know, might, you might not be smoking or drinking at another table, but your marriage is failing. When was the last time you confessed that? When was the last time you went to someone and told them, I am not doing okay. I do not have it all together. You may see me on Sunday and I preach a good word, but when I go home, I don't have it all together. When was the last time you told someone that you don't have it together? 
right? So we run to things, we run to things, we run to, come on, we, we run to teachings, to, 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 to think our way into things, to, to believe certain things, to chant certain things, to break certain things, to get, uh, uh, forgive uh, our family, who doesn't, our great grandpa who, who might have said a bad word to an Indian, and that suddenly now I'm struggling with depression. Like, we're, we go through the lengths of going through all the stuff without the confess your sins part. And we're looking for the results. We're like, why am I not free? Why am I still dealing with this? Why do I have no breakthrough? I've done all the things. I paid all the money. I've gone to the strengths. It's because you haven't, you're not doing it with the family. It's because you're not connected with the family. It's because there's people who want to know you because in knowing you will bring the breakthrough. And understanding you will bring the breakthrough. And being connected will bring the breakthrough. The wonderful results. The great power of a righteous person that produces wonderful results. So this is why we are doing family groups at Bethesda. It's because there's a giant of loneliness that is trying to take our land. It is trying to take your teenagers. It is trying to take your marriages. It is trying to take anyone that will listen to it. But today, we're putting rocks in our sling. But today, we're saying not in this house. This house will be known for two things, the Holy Ghost and the family of the Holy Ghost. The family of God. And so, I encourage you, we're gonna do kind of an altar call here in a second, um, or an activation here in a second. But with this message, I don't want this message to be something that you hear and you're like, that's nice, and wow, Anthony's such a good preacher, he's so anointed, and you go home and nothing changes. I want you to look at your life and be like, where am I not seeing wonderful results? Where is my life not growing? And then who do I have that I could share in my life where they can pray from a righteous person's perspective and bring breakthrough in my life? And if you don't have that yet, that's okay, pray for it. Because I believe that God is so good that he will bring you the family that you need. The one thing I don't wanna hear about this church, not that I've heard it, is Bethesda's amazing, but I couldn't get connected. That phrase will be banned forever for this church. We're not gonna, I don't wanna hear people say, I love the worship, I love the service, but I didn't feel family. We are just gonna kill that thing. We are gonna smother people with so much freaking love that the only reason is they feel uncomfortable. <laughs> the only reason why they leave, but. But what I want is this, is I want this to ignite something inside of you that maybe it's time to take someone out to lunch after church. Maybe it's time that you see that struggling person in your church. Maybe it's time to have a conversation with them and invite you. Maybe there's marshes in your life that you see, that you know, and maybe it's time for those marshes to experience family with you. Maybe it's time to invite those marshes into your home, to take them out to lunch, to take them out to dinner, to break bread with them, to do communi community with them. Maybe it's time for those marshes to step into who they're called to be. Or maybe you even mar are a Marsha. Or maybe you're, you're like the people that I mentioned here, which if you are, we're gonna do something for you in just a bit. Um, shaka. So this is what we're gonna do, is statistically speaking, there are people here that are struggling with loneliness. I don't need to be prophetic. I don't need to say, thus saith the Lord. The data suggests <laughs> that there are people in here right now who are struggling. And though we're launching family groups very soon, we're not, they're gonna be launched in September, we're doing the training afterwards today, I actually feel there's a, you're gonna get a breakthrough right now. And I actually believe the wonderful results of a righteous person's prayer are going to set you free from things even in this moment today. Uh, can I get someone on the keys, Mitchell or, or Carissa or, yeah, wanna hop up?
Um, what we're going to do is this, is we're going to have a really big family moment right now. Is that okay? Yeah. Do a family, we're, we're going to exercise this moment. We're going to have a family moment right now. And what that is, is I'm going to ask uh, certain people in a second, I'm going to ask them to do something, and then I'm going to ask our church to do something in response. Um, and I believe, oh man, I feel it inside of me right now. I'm like, I'm so emotional right now. I'm holding, holding back. But I actually feel that there's going to be a breakthrough that happens. I don't know some of your stories. I don't know um, who you are here. I know a, a lot of you, but not all of you. I don't know if some of you are on the, on the brink of ending your marriage. I don't know if you're on the brink of taking your life. I don't know if you're on the brink of, of, of a mental collapse. But I feel if you came today, it was for a reason. If you came today, you might feel like you just showed up begrudgingly. You might have had the wrong spirit even coming in here. You might not even like me as a preacher. But I feel today, this is for you. God ordained this day for you to receive wonderful results, to receive freedom in your life. And so what I'm gonna do is this, is in preaching today, if there's anyone here that you're like, man, I am depressed, I have anxiety, I have addiction, I feel uh, even suicidal, or even you're like, I resonate so strong with lonely, loneliness. I am lonely. I feel loneliness in my life. And not like you just feel lonely like, oh, you know, like, you know, it's small. Like, it's, it's like a big loneliness. Like, it, it's a part of you. It's the cloud. You, you feel even like a Marsha. If that's you, I want you to do something really bold, and it's okay and you might even cry standing up, and you might cry at this next activation, uh, but I want you just to stand up right now if that's you. If, if you resonate with that, just stand up right now. It could be one, thank you. It could be, two, all right, thank you. And three, four, five, six people, can we just, thank you, we just give them an applause as they stand up. Just stay standing, just stay standing. So this is what we're gonna do is um, just stay standing for a second. What we're gonna do is we are going to um, gather around them in just a second, and we're gonna share these words with them. Something, someone that uh, is struggling with anxiety, depression, addiction, there are certain words that they need to hear. Um, and this is statistically proven. And the words are that I see you, I love you, and you belong. It's I see you, and I love you, and you belong. I'm gonna say that again, because there's a stronghold here. <laughs> I feel it, you're like, mm. I say that, and you're like, no, 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 don't say that to me, don't say, I don't feel it. I see you, I love you, and you belong. I see you, I love you, and you belong. See, I, the breaking down's already beginning to happen. There's, there are stone walls. You are, you are so deep in where you at, you are cut yourself off from love. I see you, I love you, and you belong. We're just saying a couple more times, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna release the church. I see you, I love you, and you belong. One more time, I see you, I love you, and you belong.